Okay, welcome to uh, part two of 10.2 day two. And I just want to remind you that we haven't done example three and four yet. I did give you a list of formulas that you can use. Um, so those are right here. I've got position, velocity, speed, and so forth. Okay, so let's go down and let's look at example three. A lot of this can be done right on the calculator screen. So I, I don't want to spend too long on it. I just want to kind of show you the key strokes that can get you the answers quickly. Okay, so the first thing I did was I entered this into my calculator. Okay, under parametric mode. So, zoom in a little bit here. I won't be able to see all the questions though. There we go. This is that for T is greater than or equal to zero, the velocity of the particle moving along the, a curve in the XY plane is given by and these two expressions. So I actually just went into my calculator, put it in uh, parametric graphing mode. So parametric right here and made sure it's in radian mode not for this problem per se but just in case the sine or cosine pops up here or there and uh, then I just went basically into the old y equals screen and I typed in these two functions okay one is for x and one is for y they actually represent dx dt and dy dt because you can see I entered them in as given okay so the first thing they asked me that I thought might be easiest to find is acceleration and speed, but I think speed is easier to find. So let's just find the speed. We can do that straight from the home screen. The speed is the square root of the sum of the squares of the velocity. Okay? So I'm going to find the velocities at times 2. There's a couple ways you can do this. You can just go into the table mode and type 2, and you'll see the two horizontal speed and vertical speed. There they are, 0 0.81734, 0 0.8889, 88889, excuse me. Or for more accuracy, from the home screen, you can just do insert here and just press variables, y variables, parametric. Xt1, parentheses, 2. So I just typed x1 sub t of 2. That's going to give me the speed, horizontal speed, or velocity at 2. Now I'm going to do insert right here, and I'm going to do bears, y bears, parametric, y1 of 2, and enter. So the speed at t equals 2 is 1.208. So the answer is speed at t equals 2 is 1.208, probably meters per second or whatever. Okay? Now to show some work, because this is often graded, right, I would want to write speed equals the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared, and then make a little note that this is at t equals 2. So we draw a little vertical bar at t equals 2 there. How do I find the acceleration at t equals 2? Well, that's a vector, right? So I'm going to need two components for that. Acceleration at time 2 is blank, comma, blank. I get those also from the calculator screen. So I'm going to go into here, and I need the derivative of the horizontal velocity at time 2. So I can go to math 8. I'm going to take the derivative of bears y bears parametric x 1 t with t as my independent variable, so I put a comma t there, when time is 2. So I got, right, I got that right there. Enter. And that's 0.396. Okay, and then I can go back to this screen and go to math 8 again. This time, bears y bears parametric y t1 with t as my independent variable at t equals 2. The same thing, uh, but bear y bears and then going with the y1 sub t. Okay, so the y component of our acceleration is negative. 
You might say, Mr. Why didn't you take a second derivative? Please understand, I was given the first derivative, so I only needed to take one derivative here on this problem. Okay, so that is the answer for the first and second problem. And I did it right on the screen. Okay? Now it says that the, ver the curve has a vertical tangent at one point. Now this is not always a true statement, but you know uh, when a graph, when you're studying a moving object, there are moments where the path, you don't have to draw that, but you, your path might include a vertical tangent line. So there might be times when the object is moving along a vertical tangent line. I can see six in this little sketch I just drew. And one thing that's interesting about every one of these, dy dx is undefined. dy dx is undefined, right? There is no slope to a vertical line. Well, in the world of parametrics, that means that dy dt over dx dt is undefined, in which case, if any fraction is undefined, it's always the bottom's fault. So what this really implies is that dx dt is zero. In other words, an object that's moving along might be going down and then up and then passing around and then this it might go down and then up and then it passes over to here and then this goes up and then down. You see, as it passes by these particular six points, one thing's always consistently true, it has no horizontal velocity at those instants. So dx dt is simply zero is what this means. So you can memorize that if you want, but a vertical tangency will occur when dx dt is zero. So dx dt equals zero. That's what we want to solve. Okay, well dx dt was actually given. It says inverse sine of one minus two e to the negative t. If you set this equal to zero, you actually will get this solution. If you sine both sides, sin here, sin here, you get one minus two e to the minus t equals zero. Subtracting the one and dividing by negative two, I get e to the negative t is a half. Reciprocating both sides, I get e to the t is 2. In other words, t is ln 2. t is ln 2. That's a very special time at which dx dt is actually 0. Okay? Okay. Now, what happens if dy dt and dx dt are both 0? If that's the case, then we're not actually dealing with a horizontal tangent. Let me explain. So let's say, um, let me get it piece of paper here. Let's say that you have a path like this. Okay. You might say, oh, well, there's a vertical tangent, there's a vertical tangent, there's a vertical tangent, there's a vertical tangent. All four of these points have something in common. dy dt is non-zero. That means it's moving either up or down at these instances. But dx dt is zero, meaning it's not moving horizontally at those instances, right? But this is an interesting point over here. Let's look at this green point over here. So what's going on at this green point is the object came in <coughs> to this point as a cusp, right? So as it came in, when it hit right here, it has a vertical tangent, and dx dt is zero here. It's true. But the object is not moving down. It actually stops and goes back up, see? So you can tell, sorry about that, uh, you can tell that as it comes out of this point, it's got a rise, right? Which means actually the, the object actually stopped here and turned around. It went into the cusp and back out of the cusp. So at that very instant, at that actual green dot, not approaching, but at the green dot, something very interesting happened right here dx dt and dy dt are both zero. In other words, the object is truly at rest, and as it leaves this point, it leaves upwards out of this cusp. So this point would not count, you see, as a vertical tangent. In fact, it's not a tangent point at all. It's, you can't draw a tangent line there. Okay, so I just want to verify one little thing, that dy dt is actually non-zero. I don't want this kind of stopping point. So I'm going to go back and just double check that real quick. Okay, so this is what I was just looking at. And I believe that at t equals ln2, my horizontal velocity has ceased. It is zero for that instant. I want to show that dy dt is non-zero at that instant. I want to make a little note. Note that dy 
dy dt at t equals ln2 is non-zero, and I'm going to try and show that real quick. It is non-zero because it is 4 ln2 over 1 plus ln cubed 2, which is non-zero. So I'm going to state that it is non-zero. I think it's important to my argument on this problem. So I'm going to be saying, if I'm going to be saying that this point is a point of vertical tangency, I need to prove that it has a vertical velocity of that instant. Okay, that's a little subtle, but it seems necessary to me. Okay, now let's go on and talk about RC. Scribble it out just so you can see my work better. All right, we got our answer for part B. And we justified that the IDT was non-zero. Okay, let M be the slope of the tangent line to the curve at the point x, y. Write an expression for M and use it to find the limit as t goes to infinity of M of t dt. I mean, M of t. Okay, so one thing we know about m is that it's also known as dy dx, the slope of the tangent line, which in turn is also known as dy dt over dx dt, which in turn happens to be 4t over 1 plus t cubed, all over sine inverse 1 minus 2e to the minus t, like that, okay? Okay, so this is our, uh, I guess, m of t. Right? Let's clean it up just a little bit. 4t over 1 plus t cubed times sine inverse 1 minus 2 e to the minus t. And now I'm going to use this to find the limit as m goes, as uh, t goes to infinity. So the limit as t goes to infinity of m is the limit as t goes to infinity of this expression, 4t on top, 1 plus t cubed on the bottom, sine inverse of 1 minus 2e to the negative t. And as you know, when t gets very large, some of these things vanish. So I'm going to cross them out in black. So we know that this in particular is going to go away, leaving with sine inverse 1. On the bottom, sine inverse 1 is literally just pi over 2. So that's very non-threatening. We have basically limit as t goes to infinity. The sine inverse part goes to pi over 2. So we have this. These are not the same expression, but their limits are the same. And this is bottom heavy, as you can see. So this actually goes to 0. So what does this mean? That it means that the slope is approaching zero. Now, if you look back at the graph, you can see evidence that the velocity is going to zero. Let me show you. Maybe you already peeked at this graph. Um, but please understand that this is a velocity graph, not a, uh, a path graph. So this does not show what the particle is doing. This just shows how the velocities are behaving. As you go toward the right here, as t goes to the right, it seems like the velocity drops off to zero. But that doesn't necessarily mean that your, that your object is approaching a horizontal tangent. Just rather, the fact that right here, dy dt is zero, and dx dt is, you know, one point something, and this is as t goes to infinity. Basically, as t goes to infinity, what we're saying is, sorry, I interrupted myself there. Um, dy dt is going to zero, and dx dt is going to pi over two is what's happening here, as we saw on the bottom there. Okay? So, uh, this is as t goes to infinity, the object goes like this. This is not its path of travel, but this is a, a mapping of its velocities. We have a positive movement to the right, but it's approaching a y velocity of zero. If that's too hard for you to understand, it doesn't really matter. The point was to find that limit, and we did. And it's a little hard to see from the velocity graph what it means. Hopefully you followed that. Okay, let's go on to answer the next question. The 
the graph of the curve has a horizontal asymptote of y equals c, write an improper integral that represents this value of c. Okay, so it's important you understand that this question is asking us to basically set Lim t goes to uh, x goes to infinity, excuse me, of y of x equal to c. Okay? This is the actual definition of what it means to have a horizontal asymptote on the right side of a graph. So this is the definition of horizontal asymptote. Notice it's an x, right? Okay. Now, we are uh, using an independent variable of time, so we could write lim t goes to infinity y of t equals c. The problem is we don't actually have y of t, right? We don't actually have that. One thing we do know is that if you integrate dy dt over time, right, this is going to give you a change in y. Uh, that was a d dt, a dt, excuse me. This will give you delta y, right? That's what integrating dy dt is going to do. It's going to give you a change in y if we provide many full limits and integration. So since they had mentioned in this problem, let's go back and read it one more time. Let's go back and read that it mentions time two. At time two, we were told that the particle is actually at six negative three. It might make sense to use time two and time infinity as our limits, right? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna squeeze in my function now to look like this. The integral from two to infinity of dy dt is equal to the change in y, that is y at infinity minus y of two. And we don't usually write the infinity in there, we usually use that little b and then an lim, right? So I'm gonna change this to a b and a b. I'll do that in green. So this is a b and a b. we end up with oh I forgot to write my LAM right here. LAM B goes to infinity. LAM B goes to infinity. I'm gonna isolate this term right here. Because this is what I was looking for. This is C. Okay, so I think we got it. So we can write our answer like this. Um, I'll put it in black across the top. The limit as b approaches infinity of y of b is also known as c, right? That's the definition of horizontal asymptote. That's c. It's equal to y of 2 plus the integral from the, the uh, lim b goes to infinity, integral 2 to b, 4t over 1 plus t cubed dt. That's a t cubed. Okay. And uh, remember, y of 2 was 6. It's actually given in the problem. No, it's a negative 3, excuse me. Negative 3. Okay, so the answer is, I'm going to write one more time. C is negative 3 plus, and if you were allowed to write as an improper integral, you don't have to write the LIM, actually. So I'm just going to put it back into 2 to the infinity, uh, from 2 to infinity, 4t over 1 plus t cubed. Okay, so that's kind of a tough one, but that was on a, I forget which test that was on. Basically, negative 3 plus the integral from 2 to infinity of 4 over 1 plus t cubed dt. That's my answer. I'll highlight it here in... Uh, Yellow, that's the answer to this problem. Kind of a tough one. Okay, let's go on and look at the next problem. Okay, in this problem it mentions that we have a particle moving on an ellipse. This is the position function you see here. We're trying to find the velocity vector. 
Okay, sometimes it could just be a pain to take the derivative here, right? But you definitely would want to use your uh, quotient rule both times here, I would think. So I took the derivative, uh, basically low d high, and I got t cubed plus 1 times, and then 3t to the half minus, and then high d low, 2t to the 3 halves times 3t squared, all over low squared, comma, and then high, I'm sorry, a low d high minus high d low. I'll use red for high d low because I can see it better. 1 minus t cubed times 3t squared all over low squared. And I took the time to kind of clean this up for you. So it all kind of boils down to this in black. The velocity as a function of time is 3t to the half minus 3t to the 7 halves all over t cubed plus 1 squared, comma. And then the next one kind of foils out and simplifies down to negative 6t squared over t cubed plus 1 squared. Now that we've found the velocity vector, we can ask the next question. Basically ask, is there a time when the particle's at rest? So a particle will be at rest when both dy dt and dx dt are zero. That's very, very important. So we need v to be equal to zero. That means dx dt is zero and dy dt is zero. So we kind of need to solve both of these. 2t to the 3 halves is a position. So we need to take the derivative of that. Actually, we have our velocity vector. Let's just steal that. So we're going to take the first component here in yellow and set that equal to zero. So we're going to take 3t to the half, 3t uh, to the half, minus 3t to the 7 halves, over t cubed plus 1 squared, and set that equal to 0, and also negative 6t squared over t cubed plus 1 squared equals 0. We're going to try to solve both of these. If we get a common answer that agrees, then we can assume that the answer is yes. Okay, so the first one, a little harder to solve. Let's look at the second one first. This is only true if t equals 0. The top is 0 and the bottom isn't. The second one has more than one answer. If you factor out a 3t to the 7 halves, you'll see what I mean. You actually end up getting, actually I want to factor out 3t to the 1 half. You would get 1 minus t cubed. Now this has roots at 0 and 1. Okay, so in other words, is the time 0 and 1? or is it just time zero, we said that the velocities in the horizontal realm and the vertical realm have to be zero at this particular time. That's called at rest, okay? At rest. So we have to assume that it's at t equals zero only. So the answer is yes. At t equals zero only, both components of the velocity are zero. And that concludes the lesson for 10.2, day two.